Well, uh, welcome everybody to uh, today's training. Max, welcome, uh, welcome to the training. It's good to see you again. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, well, we're certainly glad to have you. So we have a, a really good turnout for today's topic. Uh, we're going to be talking about heat pumps and specifically how heat pumps are not boilers. Uh, Max has joined us because he has quite a bit of knowledge that he can add to this conversation. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the, the near heat pump piping that's similar to boilers, and we're going to talk about uh, how it's different. Um, I'll start with a little bit of background on me, and then I'll hand it over to Max. Uh, my role, I'm the technical services manager at uh, Eden Energy Equipment. I've been there for 20 years. Previous to that, I actually worked in the field. Uh, worked on traditional heating systems, uh, air source heat pumps. Uh, nothing like we're talking about now, uh, and a little bit of boilers. Uh, Max? So I started uh, very young as well. My dad would take me to, to job sites kind of as daycare when I was a little kid, <laughs> and then uh, worked up uh, um, in uh, the, the contractor role working with my dad, have since worked in the wholesale manufacturing and uh, the rep level for a little bit, and then have been uh, back with Kalefi. This was actually my first job out of college, uh, back with Kalefi for uh, about five months now, so. Yeah, and, and Max and I actually met at Ray How. So Max and I have yeah. known each other for, Long enough, I'd have to think about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, but uh, um, I always enjoyed coming up there to the, the greater Toronto area. I think it's a, a cool place and really a fun uh, hydronics market. And you guys do a good job kind of standing out with that really premium service. Uh, so it was always fun to work with you guys on projects. As does Kalefi. Yeah. So on that note, <laughs> we're going to get started. Just a couple of housekeeping items. So we do have some pretty cool handouts for you guys. Uh, so for handouts, we actually have uh, hydronics number 27. Uh, so that specifically talks about heat pumps. Um, so that's a, a really good read. I encourage you to download and read that. I actually encourage you to download all of the hydronics issues. I know I do and I read them. I know Max likes them. Nobody makes us do that. This is legit technical content that's uh, high level, but uh, well written and uh, easy to follow. Uh, we also have a RAL panel guide because we're going to talk a little bit about RAL panel and how it plays with heat pumps. And then we have a, a heat pump manual that we'll talk about because we're going to be uh, going into that here. Um, the other thing we have is a couple of polls because we'd like to get your guys' feedback. Uh, we'll maybe do that towards the end of the seminar. And so with that, Max, I'll let you do a quick uh, overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Sounds good. So we're going to start by kind of covering how a heat pump is different from a boiler. In a lot of ways, they're similar. In a lot of ways, they are different as far as we're going to hook is how we hook them up to a system. Uh, what components and applications change, why primary secondary is just important with the heat pump as it is for a boiler. Uh, and then we're gonna go through uh, a couple examples of systems, when to use a hydro separator, when to use a buffer tank with air and dirt separators, how to know kind of when uh, one is better than the other, and then uh, magnetic separation to kind of wrap up. And if you have questions, uh, type them into the chat at any point, we'll kind of keep an eye on those and then uh, catch up with all of them at the end. So that's what we're up to. And then, uh, yeah, I'll hand it back over to you for the, the first slide there. Yeah, so I think this is a great time to do a poll. Uh, so the first poll, which is a good one, is we actually want to know, uh, and I'll just launch this now, is, is sort of what portion of your business uh, is hydronic or uh, geothermal heat pumps? This will be an interesting one to see. Uh, heat pumps, whether it's geo or air to water, is a, a very small market, uh, especially air to water, as uh, as Max knows. Um, but it's growing. You know, every every manufacturer is very keen to put together an air to water unit. The electrification of uh, of North America uh, is playing into that in a big kind of way. Yeah, and I would assume that these numbers are probably going to be a little bit higher for your market than they would be uh, in some of the other. Uh, locations in the US, but let's see here. Yeah, so uh, the results are kind of interesting. Uh, so you have 53%, uh, or pardon me, you'll, you'll have to share that number back so I can't read it. 53%, <laughs> uh, 25% or less, um, 25 to 50% of the, the jobs is 19%. 50 to 75 percent of the jobs 14 and 75 to 100 is 13. So I would say that's a pretty that's a pretty big number above that uh, that 50 percent uh, that I think that that's a, a good sign for for your market. It's definitely not so high in in other places. Yeah, safe to say a lot of people that are on this call do do hydronics, do heat pumps, and that's great. It'll make for uh, 
a uh, interesting discussion. So uh, talking about heat pumps, one of the things about heat pumps is that, yeah, they're really cool. They're by no means new. Uh, there has been forms of heat pumps, whether it's in uh, water to water, air to water, air source heat pumps, going back 40 plus years. Um, you know, it, it's certainly not new. Uh, heat pumps can do a lot of really cool things. People don't always realize that. Uh, if you look at an air to water or a water to water, those heat pumps can do heating, they can do cooling, they can do hydronic heating, and they can do domestic hot water. And in fact, they can do all four of those things in one packaged unit, which is pretty cool. We can't do that with boilers, we can't do that with other systems on the market. So that's pretty exciting. Um, obviously, heat pumps use refrigerant and water, so uh, we have to be careful of that. Uh, we have to be conscious of that, that uh, it takes a little higher level of knowledge. Uh, the potential for us to cause catastrophic failure to the equipment by applying like methodologies for boilers to uh, heat pumps is significant. Uh, unfortunately, in the last 20 years, because I am the one responsible for field support, I have been to a lot of jobs. And the reason that that really expensive piece of equipment didn't last 20 years has nothing to do with the equipment. It's usually a $10 fix, which sucks for the end user. But again, that's why we try to have these discussions to sort of go through it. Um, so the top unit that you see uh, there, uh, that's actually uh, a unit that Taco is bringing to market. So that's a really cool little air to water. Uh, bottom left hand corner, that's a, a traditional water to water unit. Uh, in the middle again, that's a unit that actually Entertech is working on. And then to the right, which we're going to use for our examples today, just because it is a really cool unit, uh, that's a synergy unit. So that unit is the unit has the capability of doing forced air heating, forced air cooling, hydronic heating, and domestic hot water all in one unit. So it's a, it's a pretty cool little unit. Uh, one of the key things to keep in mind uh, is that piping is extremely critical on these units. You have to make sure you pipe them properly. Um, standard residential heat pumps don't work like boilers. Like most residential heat pumps can't lift the water 20, 25, 30 degrees. And that's important that you know that when you're selecting not just your equipment, but also your emitters, how you're going to pipe it, how you're going to set it up. The other thing is understanding what the expected flow rates are. So it, it's really important you understand how much flow do I need for that piece of equipment. You know, it's it's not that standard rule of a gallon per minute for 10,000 BTUs on a 20 degree delta T. You know, the, the math changes depending on what flow is going through the equipment. And obviously, we want to avoid any sort of adverse uh, adverse effects that uh, that can happen. So this is that Synergy unit. I only show it here so you can see where the data is coming from. Um, this is available as one of the handouts. So you can download this and go through it for yourself. So for today's examples, I'm gonna do a four ton unit. Everything I'm doing would apply to any four ton unit. I'm picking the Synergy because it's, it's really cool. It's a triple function unit. So basically this unit, uh, its total capacity at about 100 degrees uh, is 32,700 and it has a uh, COP of three. So uh, moving on, we're going to talk about how the piping is different on heat pumps. So I put together a very quick drawing. It's not complete. It's missing a few components. So we're going to pretend this is a boiler for a second. So we're going to say it's 32,000, you know, 30 to 40,000 BTUs. You know, if, if Max was doing this as a boiler, Max, you'd probably put three quarter inch pipe on that at 30 to 40,000 BTUs. Like you could maybe even argue not doing three quarter, depending on what delta T you're doing it on it. Again, that's assuming a 20 degree delta T. Um, you know, that that's practicing good piping practices, assuming we have two feet per second, two to four feet per second. But again, what happens if this unit isn't operating on that delta T that we're expecting? So believe it or not, this is the number one thing that kills heat pumps, is not piping it properly. This unit should actually have inch and a quarter piping on it. And just instinctively looking at it as a traditional boiler guy, yeah, I got 40,000 BTUs, no problem. I'll put three quarter inch, run it on a 25, 30 degree delta T everything's good. Well, the challenge with it is that this unit can't produce temperatures over 120, which we're going to talk about more later. And this unit doesn't run on a 20 degree delta T. So this unit actually runs in a completely different delta T. You're looking for typically two and a half to three gallons per ton. So this unit actually needs to have 10.9 gallons a minute going through it for you to get those 30 to 40,000 BTUs. So the irony here is it doesn't take a lot of effort to figure out what size piping should go on it. In the installation manual, the manufacturer is nice enough to point out to you that, hey, this STV049 is in fact supposed to have inch and a quarter piping on it. A lot of people would look at that, and I've seen these units where they get installed with three quarter inch copper. 
Uh, the other thing that'll happen is they'll install with three quarter inch packs. And as Max can attest, PEX and copper are not the same as many of our uh, you know, guests today will know. The other thing you have to be very careful about is that a lot of these units, although in this drawing that I've done very quickly, uh, you know, it's external. Uh, the reality is that the pump is typically built into that unit. So if you undersize that piping, you don't have any ability to correct that because the pump has been selected for you. And that would be another uh, example, let's say that you've got an existing residence and they have a boiler and it fails and they just come back in and put a heat pump in. Uh, all those things that you just described there are not going to be set up for success, <laughs> that you're going to need to do a little bit more work in that mechanical room to get it ready for a heat pump. It's not just a, a copy and paste technology uh, and it would be worth a, a deeper look at a lot of these components that you're going to kind of go through today. Yeah, I, I think it's critical too that the key thing you have to worry about is really that primary piping that's you know around your plant, whether it's a boiler or a heat pump. Uh, you know, paying attention to that is the key. The secondary piping is pretty forgiving, uh, and you're, you're going to go through that with the hydraulic separation and buffer tanks. Uh, I've just realized that that uh, you know in this drawing, it's it's not exactly the way we'd like to see it, but the reality is that the piping around the heat pump is all that needs to change. Other than the buffer tank and making sure you have hydraulic separation, don't assume that just because it was there for 20 years it worked great. You know, there's always tweaks and enhancements we can make and it's it's not a big deal to make those changes. Okay, so let's start by talking about buffer tanks. So you ride a, a bicycle, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say that for some reason your family decided that you're now in charge of keeping a light bulb on in the kitchen. And to do that, you have to sit on a stationary bike. And when somebody walks into the kitchen, you have to start pedaling and then it turns on the light bulb. So anytime somebody walks by, even if it's for two seconds to walk to a different room, you have to start up and pedal the bike. Would that be as much fun as maybe having the bike, but having a big battery that you could just ride the bike for 20 minutes and then whoever comes into the kitchen, they've got all that battery built up. Which would you prefer as the bicyclist? Well, considering COVID has hit and I haven't been to the gym in a year and it's starting to show, I think I'm okay right now just riding the bike. The first one actually, but yeah. the reality is, the reality is charging the battery makes a lot of sense. If we could yeah. charge that battery, have it charged, have it ready, it's good for a whole bunch of reasons. I mean, I'm going to get an opportunity to rest, right? That's yep. good for me. You can go eat. You can cool yeah, down. Exactly. You can... <laughs> exactly. You get you get those runs, those long run times, whether it's me on a bike or a boiler or a heat pump. They're all good things. You don't have to put your shoes on and take them back off. That's kind of what we're talking about here. So a buffer tank is going to add some volume to the system. It's going to let whatever it is, if it's a boiler or a heat pump, have a little bit longer run cycle, charge that that thermal battery, which all we're doing is adding volume you know, in, in fluid to the system. We're gonna charge that up and then we can draw off of that uh, slowly or quickly, depending on the day for the, the system side. But really it just allows our, our mechanical equipment to run longer cycles. And that's what we're looking for. It's better for the equipment uh, and it's something that is, you know, really, really uh, critical for heat pump systems. So we'll kind of talk about this uh, a little bit more. A buffer tank for a boiler system, maybe you don't need it. Maybe you can turn down low enough that let's say you've got a warehouse and it's a single zone. And even on a, you know, a warm spring day, the boiler's turn down ratio is going to go low enough that it can kind of keep up with that. Uh, we're not going to be able to, to do that the same way with a heat pump. We want to have some capacity. We want to add to some volume there. So, um, and they're not going to modulate the same way. So that's kind of a, a key thing here is that a boiler may have a 10 to 1 turndown ratio and be able to modulate way down to a, a low flame. It's not really how the, you know, the compressor is going to work with a heat pump. We may be on and off. We may have a couple stages. We may have some variability, but it's not going to be quite the same as what a modern you know, mod, modcon boiler will do. So we've got to go way down uh, in order to be able to handle that little micro load. We need to add volume in, in order to do that with this mechanical system. So if you look at the photos here, the one on the, the right is kind of a traditional uh, buffer tank with a heat pump. So a buffer tank is just a big wide spot in the river there, four ports. Um, the one on the bottom, so could that be a buffer tank in a residential system? That's a, it's like a 10 inch flanged Kalefi hydro separator. Is that any different from that, the buffer tank on the right side? 
Yeah, I mean, it's the same solution, right? It's a little, little costly for this application. A little bit more not... expensive. We'll take the sale, but <laughs> it's a little overkill here. But the, the technology is the same here. You could just put, you could reduce that down to one inch connections for the hydro separator uh, in the bottom center there, and it would just be a buffer tank at that point. Uh, I, and I'll kind of go over it, I think, on the, um, a little bit later, so I'll hold on with that part. But um, a hydro separator could be a substitute for a buffer tank if it's big enough. So if you're going for a one inch hydro separ, it's separator, it's not gonna be a substitution for the buffer tank that's on the right side of the slide here. It's too small, there's not enough capacity there. You could go bigger and have a little bit of buffer capability there, but it's kind of a different animal. So a hydro separator is, is the smallest uh, way that you can do primary secondary piping, but it's not built to be uh, a huge volume. That's not its that's not its superpower. <laughs> so a buffer tank is built for volume first. Hydro separator is probably built for air and dirt and primary secondary uh, first as the number one feature, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So that's kind of the background. And maybe on the next slide we'll go over how do we figure out what size buffer tank we need. So first yeah, of I all, think, I think you make a good yeah. point, Max. So like in a in a residential project. A hydro separator, you're going to struggle to make that make sense. Uh, but again, you can get into some large residential projects. You know, some people will count the hydro separator, the pipe that goes with it. There is an opportunity for it. I think where a hydro separator makes more sense is there's newer technology coming in the market. And so we have to throw that caveat out that Max and I are talking about product that's in the marketplace right now. There are products that are on the cusp of coming into our market where they are fully variable speed, right? So at that point, you can get away from a buffer tank. Uh, there are products where a uh, SEP4 is going to work great. There's other products where a buffer tank is going to work great. If you look at that photo uh, from Coolins, you'll notice it has two ports on each side. So that actually is your hydraulic separator and your buffer tank. Like uh, Most buffer tanks, you can't pipe them like that. you got to get creative. So there's a lot of products out there that work, uh, but either way, you have to have hydraulic separation on yeah, and that, um, we'll talk about it a little bit later. The hydro separator compared to an air and dirt separator, uh, for the most part, it depends on what your labor hour is, <laughs> if that's a good decision for you or not. If you're willing to you know, prefab everything that you're going to do and have somebody solder it together in the middle of Iowa somewhere and drive it over in a, a Prius or something like that, it may be cheaper. If it involves you assembling all of that on site in Toronto somewhere, it, it may be a lot more expensive to do all that assembly on site. So that's kind of where you can make the decision between separate air and dirt versus all in one packages. In, yeah, in some so, cases. so Max, from my perspective, and again, our, our company, I, I'm not in sales, but our team has done that cost analysis. My analysis is like yours. It's the easiest, you make four easy connections, it's sweat, threaded, press, whatever you want. It is less money if you're doing air, dirt and separation. You could argue I'm not doing dirt, and we would probably wonder why with ECM pumps. We're going to let Max talk about that later. If you were doing just air and separation, you'd save a little bit of money. But again, labor costs are not going down. They're going up. I'm all for a package hydraulic separator. To me, it's a no-brainer. Yeah. Okay, so for this slide, how big of a buffer tank do we need? So I could just say every single job in America should have a 500-gallon buffer tank. Um, there's not really any performance issue with that. Um, you wouldn't have the space probably. It'd be way too expensive. Uh, there are some other kind of concerns with that, but having that huge battery is not a problem. So bigger is okay to go with the buffer tank, but um, if you wanna get to the, you know, if you're in a competitive bid situation, you wanna make sure that you have the appropriate size, the right size buffer tank. Here are a couple ways to figure it out. So the formula on the left, and this is from the Kalefi Hydronic 17, this is assuming that you have a minimum on-off uh, buffer tank here. So if you plug in all the numbers here, we can say that we want a, we're trying to solve for the number of gallons. We want to turn on the heat source for a minimum amount of time. So if you put in one minute there, you're going to have a really small buffer tank. If you put in 10 minutes, if you put in 15 minutes to keep those run cycles longer, that's going to you know, multiply the, the size of your buffer tank out. So what we're doing here is taking the maximum minus the lowest that it'll go. So if it's an on-off, then it might be you know, 100,000 to 50,000. That's as low as you're going to go. Um, and then what is your smallest load? So if you've got 20 zones and one of them 
is a you know a towel rack in a bathroom that's on a zone valve for some reason that's going to be a very 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 small micro zone if your goal is to be able to keep that on for that amount of time for 10 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever you're going to need a lot more buffer tank to do that so those are kind of the factors that come into play there how low can your heat source go and how tiny is that tiniest zone if we're talking about a warehouse with a, a north and a south zone then again your buffer tank is probably going to be smaller because you don't have a super super small micro zone but in residential applications that's where you can look at you know, a bigger a buffer tank if it's if it's covering those micro zones so that's for an on off heat source if you're doing a modulating heat source then it's the lowest turndown that we're talking about. But one of the things that's interesting with that, so let's say we've got a 100,000 BTU boiler. It's got a 10 to one turndown, so it can go down to that 10,000 BTUs per hour output. Uh, let's say your smallest zone is actually 10,000 BTUs. So on a design day, you could go 24 hours a day straight out to that zone and back. How many design days do we have in a year? <laughs> so every other day of the year, you're going to be some number less than 10,000 and it's not going to keep that boiler on and it's going to cycle. So even worse with the heat pump, we want to have a little bit more capacity there uh, in order to do that non-design day, smallest load uh, situation. And that's what you can use these formulas for, uh, kind of for on off and then for a modulating heat source to find the right size. And you may be surprised that it's bigger than you thought. And it could be because your micro zone is too small <laughs> and maybe put that on a, a zone with something that's a little bit bigger too. You know, this can be a design decision, a controls decision as well that might uh, make your buffer tank size smaller. So that's kind of a quick tour through that. Um, but yeah, every job site is going to be different and that's what designers can kind of help walk through what the, the proper uh, setup is going to be per, uh, per job site. So, what we're looking for um, is no pressure drop between the tank ports. So in a, a buffer tank, like we talked about before, it's a primary secondary device. We want to decouple the boiler or the heat pump loop from the distribution from the system side. So uh, a, a good way to do this is to have short fat headers, which um, we've, which is something that Michael puts into a lot of his designs. It's a good way to go. The storage is providing a, the volume is providing some stability to the system. It's not reacting really quickly to a single short call for heat in a micro zone or something like that. Uh, it's helping kind of even out the, the system and is a little bit less jumpy, I guess, is one way to kind of just define the concept of a buffer tank. So that's kind of a uh, high level where we're starting with these systems. And then uh, Michael's got some system designs on the next couple slides to go through as well. Yeah, I think the key thing to add, so the, the slide we had earlier where the Coolins had sent in that photo with that buffer tank with ports on each side, it's a really simple one. Like I, I really like that tank for a variety of reasons, but most of them are technical. It's a composite tank rated for heated, chilled, potable, doesn't matter. And because it's composite, it weighs nothing. And they come in large sizes. So we have those in 120 gallon. We use them a lot because to Max's point, you're going to be surprised how big of a buffer tank you're actually going to need. So if you run into a situation where you have a three port tank like this one, the key thing to pay attention to is if you look where Max has the purge valves in his drawing, I'll show with my mouse, it may not show so good. So this piping right here where the purge valve is before the spring check and the piping down by the magnetic dirt separator, the absolute key component to that is that piping has to be upsized enough so that the, basically there's no pressure drop there. So it has to be old, like sized so everything there is under two feet per second. And that's the critical component to it. So it makes sure that if Max is pulling off 10,000 BTUs and there is in fact another 90, that 90 is going to go into the tank. It's it basically that piping becomes part of that tank and you don't have any issues with it. So uh, we're going to talk again about our SDV 049. Um, one of the things I want to point out to you is that you know, manufacturers have their own guidelines on how big of a tank they want to see on the units. They publish it in their manuals. Uh, and obviously anything Max and I tell you, we're going to put the caveat, follow the manufacturer if you want warranty. You know, Max and I have some good ideas. If the manufacturer disagrees, you might not get warranty. Um, so that said, one of the things that the manufacturers do is they will specify to you how big of a buffer tank they want. 
So interestingly, there is some background math that goes on with that. So uh, like M Max and I like to read too much. Uh, we're kind of, you know, hydronic HVAC nerds, and I think it's a good thing. And so one of the interesting things is there's a study that was done in Europe. So in Europe, they did a study on air to water and water to water heat pumps. And what that study was done is they were trying to determine what is the ideal runtime for a heat pump to maximize your overall efficiency, your COPs of that equipment. So the study was done in 2012 and what they decided or what they discovered through the research is that if you can have that unit run for 10 to 15 minutes, that's kind of the minimum sweet spot that you want to run that unit. And the interesting part is that if you look at what the major players are suggesting for buffer tank sizes, it's awfully close to what these research studies are showing. So, you know, when you hear some manufacturers saying one gallon per thousand and some are saying two gallons per thousand, when you do the math, it actually comes out pretty close. So in this case, we took the SDV 049, we said we wanted to run for 10 to 15 minutes, uh, we wanted to do two gallons per thousand BTUs, and so basically what that ended up happening is we were putting an 80 gallon buffer tank on a four tire. So, you know, in this case it was 81.3, I mean, it doesn't matter, we, we round it down to an 80, I'm not necessarily gonna push it up to a 120, but to Max's point, if you have a 120 in stock and you're using it, I'm not too worried about that. If the 120 is similar price, not too concerned about it. So we really want to make sure this unit runs because that's where it's going to hit its peak efficiency. If it runs for five minutes and shuts off, you haven't hit peak efficiency. The other side of that too is that all equipment that gets made, they have a, a testing standard on how many times that capacitor is going to start stop. How many times is that compressor going to start stop? Any component into that. If you put really small buffer tanks into it, you're going to potentially run into some pretty serious problems. So, you know, you want to make sure your buffer tank is sized properly. Um, the other thing that comes up quite a bit is, can I just use my floor tubing? Like that, that happens all the time where people say, you know, I've got a couple of manifolds, I've got a bunch of half inch pecs on here. Can't I just count that against it? Well, we just did the math and we discovered we need a lot of water. So if you looked at just doing a little bit of quick math, uh, and if we did a synergy basically with no buffer tank, this one we're going to say it's a couple of 12 circuit manifolds. We'll say it's 300 feet long per circuit to meet CSA B214. So these manifolds combined are, are holding about five gallons in piping. Now you've got the other piping that goes with it, but if there's no buffer tank there, if you do the math on that, this unit's going to run for one minute. So I've personally never seen where somebody puts a unit in with no buffer tank. I've certainly seen where people put buffer tanks that are too small in where the equipment fails. And honestly, typically it's capacitors that start failing first. You'll start to see boards becoming weak where it start to get hot spots and fail. Like you'd be amazed what happens with buffer tanks and certainly what can result in the uh, the failure that comes with it. And when I worked um, as a, a boiler rep, my favorite boilers that we went and checked on were the ones that were just on all winter. <laughs> You know that had like they started in the fall and they turned off in the spring because it's just it, it's that better you know techmar talks about like cycle efficiency or having the past that it's better for everything if it just stays on for a really long time if you could just have a system designed that you've got those heat pumps on for you know 23 hours of the day um that's good that's not a problem you know i think that from a homeowner perspective if you go in and say hey we're going to replace your system down here and the one we're going to put in is going to be on all day initially there's like a oh, wait a second that doesn't seem like the most efficient that seems like it's going to be an expensive way to do it but it's really not that's when machines are happiest when you're not you know turning them on and off all the time if you tried to turn your car completely off at every red light that you hit going into the you know, Toronto airport or something like that, that wouldn't be a happy car. And in a similar way, that wouldn't be a happy, you know, hydronics mechanical room. Yeah, well, if you don't have a modulating piece of equipment, I use a slightly different analogy. So it's like you basically getting in your car at work or home and then you just slam on the gas until you get to a stop sign, you slam on the brakes. Yeah. And then you slam on the gas, you slam on the brakes, you know. With modulating equipment, it's, it's not so bad, right? Yeah, yeah, it's going to ramp up, it's going to find its spot, it's going to idle along. You have to be very conscious of that. And to Max's point, he's exactly right. If we can have this unit run low and slow, it's really, really good. One of the most common calls that we'll get on a heat pump is end users will be terrified because they've never had a heat pump before and it's running all the time. All day. So they're completely yeah. freaked out going, oh my goodness, my heat pump hasn't shut off. And what they don't understand is that 
the way that a heat pump works is we're moving most of the energy passively, right? We're, it's, it's sort of like a fridge. If you went behind your fridge and went, why is it cold back here? It's because we're rejecting all that heat from your food. A heat pump's the same thing, right? We're either rejecting heat to air condition the home or we're extracting heat uh, if we're going to heat the home. So it's gonna run low and slow all the time you know, it's it's not a bad thing. What is actually really bad is if the unit cycles like Max is talking about. And then the other thing to be very cautious of is most heat pumps have defrost cycles, which you can't control when it comes to air to water. Uh, you don't see that in geo, but in geo, the thing you have to pay attention to is most units have electric resistance backup heat inside of them. So you have to be careful as a homeowner. If you start running a schedule on your heat pump and think I'm gonna save money because in the morning, it's gonna go back three, D, three degrees, in the evening, it's gonna come back three degrees. It doesn't work that way with a heat pump. You're actually forcing the resistance heat to come on, when the reality is you could just run it efficiently as a heat pump, low and slow, and without using any sort of secondary heat source on it. Um, the other one I just wanted to sort of randomly throw in here that I, I just wanted to talk about, because there really wasn't another place about it, uh, it's just sort of piping units in general. Again, coming back to what Max was talking about is making sure we have them piped properly. One of the things you have to be careful about with heat pumps is you don't want to run into a situation where you have refrigerant migration, which will also result in equipment failure. So if you have multiple uh, water to waters on, on a job, you want to make sure that if that unit is not supposed to be operating, don't have any water flowing through that. Let's not cause any funkiness. Similar to if we have multiple boilers in an array, let's make sure that those boilers are not rads when they're not running. Apply the same principle when you're doing any kind of a water to water, air to water application. Uh, make sure they do get piped properly. The other thing I wanted to point out to you is that there is a piece of equipment that's very critical that you don't use on a boiler, and that's a PT port. So the PT ports are shown on the equipment here. If you don't have PT ports on the equipment, you can't benchmark it, you can't troubleshoot it. The reason that you can't do that is because, especially in a water to water piece of equipment, we need to know what is the flow on that equipment, not just on the load side, but on the source side. And we're gonna do a heat of extraction and a heat of rejection calculation. So the good news is modern equipment has the controls built into it. Uh, some of the products like Takeo's air to water actually has the PT ports built into it. So you can't forget them and it, it happens a lot. Uh, other modern equipment, including stuff that Water Furnace makes and some of the others, they actually have that built in. So you can plug a little tool in and it tells you what the flow is, what the pressure drop is, et cetera. But you know, anybody who's done any amount of service knows that those things fail. So I'm you know, not crazy old school, but you know, Max and I, are, you know, our, uh, our daycare was a service truck. So our fathers <laughs> would always tell us, plan ahead. You know, PT ports are five bucks. Make sure they get installed. They're very important. We need to know what is happening on that heat pump. Uh, it's critical to the performance of this unit. And I think on that um, on that last slide too, we talk about modulating boilers. Um, you've got four stages in that last diagram. Sorry to, to back you up. Yeah, okay. so this is, I mean, this is not a, a modulating boiler in any sense, but you do have the ability to go down to 25%, even if these are just on off, and charge that uh, buffer tank really slowly all day and maybe rotate or something like that. There are great control ways to do that, but we're not comparing, you know, 100% on, 100% off uh, you know, heat pump to uh, your residential ModCon boiler that might have a five or a 10 to one turndown. Uh, you can do this in a way that you can uh, you know, have those smaller sizes as if you added a bigger turndown with the boiler and you don't have to vent them, <laughs> which is sometimes, uh, you know, if you're talking about putting four boilers into a, a residence, even a large residence, it's a lot of uh, PVC work or, you know, uh, PP work to get out the, the roof. With these, you could put a stack of four heat pumps in and a pretty small footprint in a mechanical room too. Yeah, absolutely. And when you start getting into multiple heat pumps, that's where you start looking at more integrated controls. You know, quite a few of them have nice built-in controls to them, but HBX makes a really nice line of controls, as does Tecmar, where you can start doing lead lag controls. And depending on what the equipment is, again, although we said most equipment doesn't go over 120, you'd be amazed with vapor injection technology, which we're going to talk a little bit about, you can actually get those units up to 140, 150, but we're not saying you should do that. So at that point, you can even be applying outdoor reset technology to these units. So, 
you know, there is a lot of stuff that you do on boilers you can apply here. You just got to make sure you're really familiar with the equipment. You know, if, if it's a traditional water to water, air to water, that tops out at like 120, 125, you want to be cautious of that. The other thing you have to be very careful about is just because a manufacturer published a certain number doesn't mean you want to try to get to that number. You know, it's kind of like Max. He drives a really expensive Mercedes. I don't know what he drives. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> we'll say he drives an expensive Mercedes. You know, just because it can go 400 miles an hour doesn't mean he tries, right? It doesn't mean it's going to be the most efficient or smartest thing you could do with that vehicle. And it doesn't mean you're going to get the gas mileage that was on the window sticker at the dealership. You know, you're not going to get that. 30 miles to the gallon anymore, which is kind of the same with the, the heat pumps if you're trying to get them as, as hot as they'll possibly go. And with with boilers too, if you're running at 185 Fahrenheit set point, you're not condensing, you're not getting those numbers, you're not in the 90s anymore, so. Yeah, Okay, 100%. with this one, so if we're talking about just the, the concept of primary, secondary piping with the hydro separator, or with anything, it could be closely spaced tees, or it could be a buffer tank. You could replace anything in that middle, you know, green hydro separator in the center of the diagram there. Uh, any of those three, and you're going to have primary, secondary piping, assuming you do the closely spaced tees right, and they're not <laughs> a mile apart or something like that. But what I like to think of with this is, let's say in this example on the screen there, that the boiler has a fixed speed pump. Let's say it's 10 GPM, just to keep the math easy. And then on the system side, let's say that's an ECM pump and you've got five zones there. So they could be anywhere between all of them are open. The system side also has 10 GPM or as those start to close, maybe one of them is really small and you're down to one GPM. So what primary secondary does is it splits the two, kind of like your engine and then a clutch between you know, the rest of the gears. So you may be in first gear, you may be in fifth gear, the boiler and the engine block can go the same speed. It could be 10 GPM all day, every day. They've separated the two. So both of those can go fast. One can go slow, one can go fast. There could be four heat pumps staged. Uh, there could be 50 zones. There could be two zones. It doesn't matter. You want to separate them. So that primary secondary is the clutch in between your engine and all of your gears and that helps keep the pumps from fighting each other is kind of the primary goal there there's some temperature mixing and there's some other things that we're doing but really what we want to do is make sure that the left gpm doesn't affect the right gpm and vice versa yeah so a really good application for the hydraulic separator we're talking about here so max could literally keep everything the same take the boiler out of the equation and plug in a variable speed air to water unit there no problem plug in a variable speed water to water unit there with relative ease. The only thing that changes is the heat pump. And again, paying attention to if there was three quarter inch piping there, doesn't mean it still has three quarter inch piping. And again, even if the heat pump has one inch piping on it, that just means the heat pump has one inch piping. It doesn't mean you're running one inch piping to your hydraulic separator. Yeah. And that's kind of the look at the inside of the devices if you haven't ever seen in them. So. Uh, what makes the hydro separator different is that it's got that air and dirt uh, separation media that I'll talk about kind of at the end of the presentation. Um, but it's there's nothing magic going on in the inside of it. It's just an open chamber. It's just a small buffer tank. Yeah. And again, on the secondary side, you've upsized your piping. So again, you've got less than two feet per second. You're not having any kind of pump competition and, and utilizing zone valves, which is which is great. Okay, so as far as, um, and we've mentioned some of these things before, uh, some people will ask, you know, what is, how do you, could you make your own hydro separator? Yeah, absolutely. It's just a three to one ratio between the pipe and the barrel, and you want to have a lot slower velocity go through there to have any sort of, you know, way to meet that, uh, that primary secondary requirement. If the velocity is, is too high, if your ratio is too small, if you make it out of one inch pipe instead of three inch pipe or something like that, kind of lose all those uh, those pieces of the primary, secondary, and your velocity through there might be high enough that you're not going to separate air and dirt as well. So absolutely, you can build your own. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's the um, best use of a labor hour. <laughs> That's why these things, you know, with the mounting bracket come in a box ready to go, and it's, it's definitely a time saver. So uh, that's kind of what is at play here with the sizing and then um, the way that it's shown here with you know, the short fat headers on the, the system side. Uh, this basic diagram 
will work for many, 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 many systems. <laughs> you don't need to get more complicated than this. You don't need to have a lot of additional things going on. And if everything's designed for low temperature on the distribution side, even better. So then we're not adding mixing devices and things like that. We're happiest when our boiler is not working very hard due to the low temperature or our heat pump, and we are distributing low temperature. So we don't need 180 degrees Fahrenheit for anything anymore. And I won't say anything anymore, but for most cases, it's overkill. It's some you know thing that we have been taught that you need to go to those really high temperatures. It's not good for anything. It's not good for the equipment. Um, it's not as comfortable if you're going 180 degree baseboard off 180 degree baseboard. That's what people don't like about their heating systems. So that kind of low and slow is kind of uh, what we're looking for here. And this this basic piping diagram would would get you there. Yeah, I would say that this is 98% of what our piping diagrams look like. The only thing that would change is like Max and I are kind of alternating between pumps and valves, depending on what slide you're looking at. Um, you could do this exact same thing, having zone valves and just basically have one pump. Um, you know, it comes down to your personal taste. Some people prefer to have multiple ECM pumps and I'm not going to knock it. It gives them redundancy. It means that if they lose a pump, they don't lose the whole building. It doesn't matter whether it's a boiler or a heat pump. As long as you're using ECM pumps and being somewhat conscious in the sizing of them, you know, I, I don't try to argue with people on how they want to do it. You know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to do it. If these are all 2699Fs going to a three station manifold, we need to talk <laughs> <laughs> or 0013, you know, but yeah. uh, as a general rule, this, this is what it looks like for us. It, it's a really solid way of doing it. Um, to Max's point, uh, I just wanted to move on to quickly a, a slightly different topic. So you'll notice that Max doesn't have closely spaced T's in anything he does. I don't have closely spaced T's in anything I do, uh, including with boilers. I, it's not necessary. Um, you know, the, the math is not that difficult for us to figure out how to get around not using those. So uh, I've been involved in many jobs where they've used closely spaced T's. So all this photo or this drawing is illustrating is it's actually showing what happens when you use closely spaced T's. So you're gonna have a temperature gradient. So you're gonna have a negative temperature cascade where from the first manifold to the last manifold, you're gonna lose temperature, right? So in this case, in the modeling, my first manifold's got 115, the next one's got 112. That difference in temperature is gonna be dictated by your delta T. So if the first unit was an air handler, for example, and then after that you had manifolds, you can actually run into scenarios where you can heat the first zone, and by the time you get to the last fifth or sixth zone, you actually can't heat it because you've got a heat pump that can't be turned up. You know, a lot of cases, to Max's point earlier, you put a boiler in, you pipe it on closely spaced T's, and like, I don't know what's going on. We've got six of these closely spaced T's, and the last one, we don't have very good heat. How do they fix it, Max? Pre-pipe. <laughs> Turn the temperature up, right? Like or you know, change the room that you're in. You change <laughs> which master bedroom and uh, guest bedroom because that room's so always cold. So if it's a boiler, they'll turn the water temperature up. If it's a heat pump, yeah, Max yeah. is going to a different room. Uh, the reality is the fix is actually one slide back. So I've personally been involved with jobs like this, and it's honestly just people not recognizing the limitations of a heat pump. The fix is to make it look like this. Right? It's literally just moving that T from the closely spaced T down to the return line. Now everything has the same temperature. You're not worried about that cascade. So on two manifolds, is it really going to be that big of a deal? Probably not. But typically heat pumps are not really going in starter homes. As much as Max and I love them and we're not alone in that, you know, there's a lot of you know people on this call that really like heat pumps. A lot of them are going in high-end homes. They've got multiple zones, many manifolds. Closely spaced T's can definitely be a problem for you. Um, I've just thrown in a photo of the of the buffer tank that we like because I want everybody to be able to see those ports on the side in comparison to the hydraulic separator that uh, Max has been talking about. This is your hydraulic separator. It is not air elimination. It's not proper dirt elimination, but it certainly gets the job done on a heat pump to give you that hydraulic separation. So basically, yeah, don't do not do closely spaced T's. We would really appreciate it if you did not do that. The other thing that's worth talking about is, uh, is mixing on heat pumps. You know, again, we're talking about most heat pumps generate 120 degree water. Now they can go higher than that in some cases, like a traditional water to water, you can run it up to 130. We're gonna talk a little bit later about why you don't wanna do that. And there are some that can do 140, 150, but most heat pumps, they're not gonna be running at that temperature. So in this job, the photo on the left is kind of a primary secondary. 
Uh, they had a little bit of a, a piping abomination that happened there. But really the biggest problem was you're trying to mix water that's 120 with a mixing valve that needs, you know, 27 degrees. So, you know, Max, if we put one of your Kalefi mixing valves in here and tried to mix from 120, how are we going to do that? You're not going to get 120 out. <laughs> so <laughs> that uh, you might be down in the, you know, below 100, you know, 90, 95, something like that uh, on the outlet. So we don't need that. If those are the temperatures that you're shooting for, just go straight out to those zones. If you're mixing, if you have something that's 180 degrees in the distribution that you need, 180, and then the next thing down the, the series there can't have more than 140, then you need to mix with that. But if this is all the same thing going out to you know a, a system, there's no need to go hot and mix back down. It's just uh, you know driving with one foot on the the gas, one foot on the brakes at, at that point. Yeah, and in this case, you're not even hot. You're you're the ideal temperature you want to be. You're attempting yeah. to mix it down. So the complaint from the building owners it's not working and the fix that they did on the right that's been working great this contractor got a lot of referral business from this builder out of it was just take the mixing valves out like they, they shouldn't be here let's get rid of them obviously be careful you know if they're using a water heater with the element turned on be aware of that the other side of that is again there are pieces of equipment that can get you above 120. there's a lot of scenarios where you don't need to do that and we're going to just briefly talk about one so this is actually a, a vapor injected water to water unit so it's really cool it can produce up to about 140 degree water, which is significant. In this scenario, yeah, you're you're definitely going to want to make sure that you either run it and set it at 120, 125, or if you're planning to run it up and run multiple zones, you're gonna have to have some sort of mixing on it. Uh, this job, the photo actually comes from Clarksburg Contractors. So this is multiple OptiHeats all tied together in series. They put a lot of really nice Techmar controls on it. You can't see the buffers. They're actually on the other side of the wall, but it's a really solid high temp, high temp uh, heat pump installation that these guys did a really good job on. So again, we're gonna talk about the whole output temperature versus overall COP. Uh, again, coming back to mine and Max's point, doesn't matter whether it's a boiler or a heat pump, why are we like just slamming on the gas if we're just driving down the street and we should be going 50? Why are you going 300 if you can go 50? So with a geothermal heat pump, it's unique in that it's quite stable, right? The ground loop is put in and we have control over that ground loop. So as long as we size that ground loop correctly, we can actually peg what the entering source water temperature is. So we can say it's 30, it's 35, depending on where you are. And we're talking obviously in heating numbers here. So if I run that unit at 120, I'm at a COP, of, let's say around 2.7 inch, something like that. Well, if I decide not to run that at 120 and say, no, I'm gonna design my system for 100 degrees, which is more than adequate for a radiant floor heating system, then you actually increase your COP to like 3.6. These same math rules apply with an OptiHeat. So that OptiHeat, when you're running it at 150, as you reduce that water temperature, you're pushing up your overall heating COP and making that unit significantly more efficient. The other side of that is you're not riding that unit. You're not pushing that unit to its limit. We talked about it earlier, these units have refrigerant in them. When you're running these units up to their maximum operating temperature, you are giving that compressor a beating, just like Max is doing to his car when he goes 300 miles an hour to drive to the stop sign. So you definitely wanna make sure you pay attention to your design temperature. Just because it can do 140 doesn't mean you should. If you actually back that off, just like with a boiler, you're going to improve the overall system efficiency and the lifespan of that equipment. So the other thing is it would apply the same. This is just an air to water unit. So in particular, this one is the Takeo air to water unit that they're bringing to market that we're pretty excited to learn more about. Same principle. The only thing you can't control here is you can't control the outdoor design air temperature. So make sure if you're picking an air to water piece of equipment that you get something that's designed for your climate. So in Canada, it gets pretty cold. In Utah, it gets pretty cold though too, doesn't it, Max? It does, yeah, not yeah, this so year. Most years. <laughs> you're going to want to make sure you pick a piece of product that is designed for the heating climate and you're going to be looking for these tables the manufacturers all publish them so with a geo unit you have some control over it uh with these units you don't you know you have to make sure you pick the right piece of equipment uh from the beginning to make sure you have success the other thing we want to talk about is a lot of people like well it's too difficult to get it down so this is a scenario where we did a job they wanted to do everything on 12 inch spacing, which had the supply temperature at 120. 
and we looked at what would it take for us to get it down under 110. We didn't make any changes. We didn't change the material. We didn't do row panel. We didn't do row board. Nothing fancy. We just tightened the spacing on the pipe, right? Same footage, and we went from 120 to 109. It, it made a huge difference. So when you guys are doing installations, even right now, if it's a boiler installation, you want to future-proof that installation, you know, and, it, and it's not just a saying. So you're putting in a boiler today. The reality is 20 years from now, I don't think we'll be able to put boilers in. You know, the way that everything is going in Canada, I don't know about the States, Max, you can speak to that, but in Canada, they're pushing electrification, they're pushing heat pumps. So if you're doing a job and you're putting in 12 inch spacing on piping, the cost for you to go from 12 inch to six inch is nominal. And to do that, you've immediately improved their comfort, you've improved that performance of that boiler, but you've also future-proofed it. You've made it so that down the road, when you have to take the boiler out and put a heat pump in, you're doing what Max and I talked about. You're only worried about the piping between that separator, the buffer tank, and the heat pump. The rest, you know, is going to work. The other thing is you can certainly take advantage of some other really cool products here. So these are two installation photos. One is from TJL Mechanical, a really good contractor that does a lot of high-end work. So he put a product called Rowl Board in. So that has the ability to produce 20, to 20 BTUs per square foot at 110 mean. That's, that's pretty significant. Typically with new homes, we don't need anywhere near 20 BTUs per square foot. So what that means is you're actually running that system at 90, 95 degrees. And again, if we go back two or three slides, think of what you've done to that COP. You've taken that COP from 2.5 and you've pushed it up over four. And yes, they've paid a little bit more money now for the row board versus, you know, maybe me putting PEX in just on six and spacing. Max put the row board option in. So maybe Max's install was $2,000 more than mine but they paid max once up front. They're paying for my job forever. Like their, their bills are higher for the lifespan of that building. On the right-hand side, that's actually row panel. That's my house. Uh, I had a back split and uh, it was very, very poorly ducted. So I actually put in a small area of row panel. Row panel will actually deliver up to 30 BTUs per square foot, again at 110. So if you think about that, that's insane. I was running my system somewhere around 85, 86 degrees because I did not need anywhere near 30 BTUs per square foot. So think outside of the box. There's a lot of other products out there that work. These are two that we've used that work really good. You know, it, it's not as difficult as you might think to get those water temperatures down. And whether it's a boiler or a heat pump, both are really good and going to help you a lot. And I think that hydronics 50 years ago would have been a red hot boiler in the basement and then a small radiator that was also red hot in the, the rooms. And we're matching the, the two products here are a great fit for the systems we're talking about because we've got a ton of surface area. So we can go a lot lower supply temperatures to keep everybody happy. And like we're talking about with the buffer tank, if we keep that just kind of rolling along all day, just kind of pulling off of the buffer tank, that's perfect because you don't have that expanding and contracting of you know, that 180 degree baseboard and then turning it off and you hear it click, 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 and you know back and forth. That's not what we're doing here and it's gonna be just a, a perfect fit for this type of radiant with these, you know, these low mass radiant systems that don't involve concrete so you can do them on you know, upper floors and, and save the weight too. So I always really liked that product. I used to sell it when I worked at, at Rayhow, but a uh, great fit for these, you know, kind of cutting edge hydronic systems. Yeah, less than a pound per square foot, right? So that makes a big difference. If you're doing over pour, there's quite a bit of weight. There's engineering that goes with it. Like there's a lot of other perks to it. Uh, the row board in particular is very well priced, but really for me, it comes down to it's pay me now or pay me forever. <laughs> You know, I'd much rather pay a little bit more up front. That's why I did the row panel. I paid more up front. There's no question about it, but I paid once. It made a massive difference on the efficiency of the system. Okay, so for air separation, let's say you can use a hydro separator. You don't need the buffer tank. You're going to get air separation. You're going to get dirt separation. Let's say you're doing a heat pump system. You need the buffer tank, so you need a bigger space you still want that air and dirt separation. At that point, it's still worth having those as separate components. So with an air separator, like the one that we're showing here, it's very easy with anybody's air separator to get bulk air out. Like when you first turn on a hose and you get those big like, you know, water, air, water, air, you know, big gulps of air, it's easy to get that out for the most part. The trickier stuff are these micro bubbles 
uh, to get that out. That's just kind of that milky look. That'll go straight through an air scoop. So what an air separator does is it's got a lot of sharp edges in this coalescing media. So the little air bubbles, the micro bubbles will get kind of stuck to that in like a little eddy as more of them build up, then they go out the top. So that would run circles around your hydronic system with just a scoop or even through a buffer tank potentially uh, forever where the air separator helps kind of scrub those little micro bubbles up and out. So that's where it's still worth having that for the, the health of the system and the rest of your components to get more than just the bulk air out uh, a buffer tank, depending on the size of it, may still do that really well because it's a big wide spot in the river and the velocity slows down to a crawl. So you will still get that bulk air out really easily. But those little micro bubbles are tricky and that's where having an actual media in there that wouldn't be present in a buffer tank is, is good to get those, uh, those milky micro bubbles out of, uh, out of solution there. Yeah, I mean, the other thing of that too is that any kind of air that you leave in that system is not good. Right. When you hear people complaining of noise in the system, it's usually air. You see people complaining about performance of the unit. Sometimes it's air. Right. Air is an insulator. It's not good. We don't want to have it in that system. You know, a, a lot of people, they figure that, well, I flushed the system. I got all the air out of it. The reality is that until you actually heat that water up and start squeezing those micro bubbles out, they're still in that water. And that's why the air separator is really important. We don't use air scoops. Like I, I'm a believer. I did use air scoops, but you know, since learning about air separator, I was like, wow. I kind of felt like I was uh, doing like the moon lander. I should have been doing the Mars rover, which is really, you know, what the uh, what the air separator does. And they're easy. They're low maintenance. You know, there's not much to them. Uh, they don't go at the highest point. They go at the hottest possible point. But Calafi's done enough research that they show that even if it's not at the hottest point, after a couple of passes, it's still going to get the micro bubbles out of it. Yeah. Yeah, and on the next slide, you'll see kind of uh, that's what the commercial version looks like. Same, you know, sharp uh, edged media there, that kind of honeycomb look to get the micro bubbles. And then if you don't get the air out uh, on the next slide is hopefully what doesn't happen to you, um, that you start to have some uh, cavitation in uh, a pump. That's usually one of the the key places that is really going to have a hard time with air. So if you if it sounds like your pump, maybe it's even new, sounds like it's got a bunch of rocks in it, it's these little implosions of vapor bubbles right at the you know the very most turbulent part of the system right at the center of the impeller there and it implodes like that and it will start to rip up a you know a, a circulator very quickly. So there are some you know brand new pumps that without getting the air out and without having the pressure right, you've got a serious air problem that's going to go right to the, you know, the circulator there. And it's not a fun conversation to have that those, those pumps need to be replaced because of cavitation. And it's just not gonna be, it's not gonna be the right uh, way to move uh, the fluid around the system. It's inefficient, it's, uh, it's damaging. So we can take care of it pretty easily with an air separator and avoid those conversations about, hey, my one-year-old pump has already completely eaten itself alive because there was a bunch of air in the system that we never got out. Yeah, it's it's really not necessary, right? Like the reality is we have the technology. It's not very expensive uh, and it ensures not just the life expectancy of your pump, but your entire system is going to work better. You're not going to get those annoying calls of my system started up in the middle of the night and was banging away and making a racket or it doesn't seem to be working very good. Okay, so now on the dirt separation side, so this is probably, you know, with any modern equipment, this is very important. And this is something that a buffer tank, again, uh, it is a wide spot in the river. So the velocity, the fluid velocity slows down. So some dirt's going to settle right there, but it's not a dirt separator. That's not what it does. So the a, a separate dirt separator is built to get all of the garbage out of the system, not necessarily on the first pass. So if you look at a Y strainer, it's a net and all the dirt that goes into that clogs it up and then eventually you either have to blow it down or you reduce the flow through the system. So a dirt separator like the ones shown here, don't do that. There's an unobstructed path through and it's really even things down to the diameter of a white blood cell will eventually hit one of those coalescing medias and drop down to the bottom. 
So it's not a filter in the same way that it's going to plug up with a bunch of garbage the first pass through. It's going to, over time, get that really, really, really small stuff down um, beyond what you're going to be able to do through a Y strainer or else the Y strainer would just plug up immediately. So that's kind of the advantage is you keep the good flow rate, but you still get the really, really small stuff out of the system. The, um, the graph on the bottom center there shows that even at different flow rates, uh, you don't have that, you know, it, it doesn't plug up. So it doesn't change the, the pressure drop across that device, where if you have a Y strainer that's 70% plugged, you get up to 14 GPM, you're really adding a lot of resistance to that system. We don't want that. We want to keep the pumps happy. We also want to keep that uh, the stuff out of the system. It can be anything, welding residue. Magnetite is another big one. And what we do for that specifically is with these dirt magnet devices, so we'll put a magnet in the bottom of it. So it's even catching the stuff that it's, I mean, it's it's almost like a, you know, if you took a pencil it's shaving. Black sand, right? Like yeah, black sand, yeah. You can barely even grab it. And what you can do with this is you catch it with the magnet because what you want to do with the dirt separator that has a magnetic function, if the magnetite is in the system, you want to keep it from going to the more expensive magnet, which is going to be your ECM pump or into your boiler or into your heat pump. We want to catch all that magnetic stuff in the dirt separator and protect it from going into the expensive components, which is why it's a good placement to put that right before your ECM pump or something. Uh, that's where we want to catch the magnetite. We don't want that to get stuck to the, uh, the, I think on the next slide, I've got a picture of a pump that was actually, the one on the bottom right there was in the Kalefi North America headquarters, kind of right as we were starting to figure out uh, magnetic separation. And this was a, a Velo Stratus and it wasn't working. We took it apart and we're like, wait a second. <laughs> and uh, we've got a bunch of you know magnetic debris all over the the ECM pump there and it it was not happy with that so the better place for that to get stuck is in the the magnetic separator upstream of that and then just you can see the the strainers and the other garbage um in a boiler cross section on the left there we don't want that there we want that in the dirt separator that we can blow down we can take the magnet out and get rid of that uh it's better for the life of the system we want these things to last a really long time they're more expensive than the traditional you know forced air system Nobody likes talking about how they fell apart because there was a little bit of black magnetic powder on <laughs> one of the, the components. We want to catch that upstream. So Well, in a lot of cases too, Max, people will go, well, I've, I've never had a system fail. I'm not going to bother putting a dirt separator in. I think one of the big things people need to pay attention to, whether it's a heat pump or whether it's a boiler, less than one per, per million of scale, which is less than the thickness of a dime, knocks 10% of your system efficiency off. So yeah. you can go and put in a fancy new heat pump you can't be bothered to put a dirt separator and spend 120 bucks or whatever it is to put it in. And you've just put this really efficient heat pump in and you just murdered its efficiency because yeah. you couldn't be bothered to put a proper dirt separator on it. So, you know, as Max said, the, the pumps, they're magnets. They, they don't like this stuff. Some pumps I find are better than others. I know in our own lab, we like to experiment. We put some of those new Taco pumps in, the 0015s that have that bio barrier on it. Uh, we seized them up pretty good. And it was pretty amazing how easily we could free them up by taking the pump apart, cleaning it, putting it back together. They still run to this day, uh, but you don't know until you try, right? <laughs> so, um, last thing we're going to talk about is actually heat pump domestic hot water uh, and the considerations you have to keep in mind. So, obviously, uh, everybody here knows about CSAB 214 and the fact that we do have to store the water at 140. Uh, all of the equipment that's on the market, I shouldn't say all, most of the heat pumps on the market actually have the superheaters built inside of them. So what that means is that again, in the synergy unit we're talking about, it can do forced air heating, forced air cooling, it can do your radiant floor. So if it's four tons of forced air heating, it's four tons of radiant, but it also has a superheater on it. So the superheater is called hot water assist. And so what I find is people forget that word assist and they just think it's their hot water and it's an instantaneous tankless. So if you download that Synergy uh, manual that's attached as a handout and start reading through it, you're gonna find the output is not very much. And the other side of that is it's free energy. So basically it's just rejection heat that's being captured by that superheater and we've got to store it somewhere. So it's not a lot of energy, but if we actually store it, it's good. It's never gonna be 140 degrees though. So typically what you'll see is you'll have a preheat tank, which is what I'm showing in the drawing here. 
So on the bottom, you'll see a preheat tank. And then from that preheat tank, it'll go to an electric tank. That second tank is where we're doing that lifting of 140 degrees. So the superheaters, uh, you'll see them on forced air equipment. So if you see uh, a geo unit, for example, that's a heating and cooling forced air unit with a superheater, that superheater is not for a radiant floor. Like the true life here, we've been to jobs where they've hooked up a radiant floor system to a superheater. Again, it's only producing heat when it can. It's typically the shoulder seasons where there's energy left over and it gets dumped into a preheat tank instead of being dumped out into the ground loop, which is great for performance. It actually improves the overall efficiency. You can do a standalone tank if you wanted. Uh, so towards the top, you can see we've got sort of a standalone tank set up. The challenge in doing that is that you have to make sure that it is in fact an electric tank with the element at the top. Uh, if it's a gas fired tank, what'll happen is because the combustion is happening at the bottom, it's gonna heat up from the bottom, it's gonna put the hot water through the superheater and the heat pump's gonna go, well, this water's too hot, I'm just gonna shut off. In the summertime, you'll actually have a reverse thermal siphon effect. So you're actually gonna kill your cooling efficiency because as that water heater's running, you're dumping energy into that heat pump that it, it really doesn't wanna see. So you have to be cautious of how you do these. Typically what we see is guys will do a standard like single electric water heater. Other guys uh, and gals will do a, a preheat tank on it. The preheat tank is better. You, you can capture a lot more energy. It's a cost thing. There's a lot of jobs where you can't justify the extra $500. It's a water heater. We're calling it a preheat tank, but it's just a water heater that's not wired. So in a lot of cases, you can't justify the cost, the piping. There's a lot of labor that goes into that. So you definitely need to pay attention to that. One thing you absolutely cannot do on a water to water or an air to water unit is you don't wanna be hooking them up to a traditional indirect. You know, running at 120 degree water, the surface area in that indirect is not designed for that. So you have to be conscious of that. There are a couple different ways you can get around that. Uh, some guys will do like an external heat exchanger and they'll use that. Uh, I'm not against that. My personal favorite is to do a reverse indirect. So there's two different manufacturers that make them. We use the TurboMax product. I know a lot of heat pump manufacturers have started using the TurboMax product. So basically, rather than storing the domestic hot water, we're actually storing the heat pump water. So the nice part about that is because we're not storing water, we just got around that whole 140 degree. But even still, we could then feed that water to a tankless unit, whether it's an electric tankless or a natural gas or propane tankless. So we could lift that water if they're using it for a sanitization cycle or, or something else to that effect. So, you know, I'm a big fan of the TurboMax. You could certainly do a, a standalone plate heat exchanger on it as well. There's a couple of different ways to get around it. Just don't be hooking an indirect directly up to it because the other thing you got to keep in mind is that coil, how much volume is in that? Right. What do you think is in a max five gallons, 10 gallons? Yeah, it's not, it's not enough to move that fast. Going back yeah. to the buffer tank conversation, we want to make this unit run. We did the math, right? I, I think we did, uh, it would run for one minute if we had five gallons of storage. You're going to kill that heat pump in a hurry. It needs that buffer. It's not designed to operate that way. So this is a, is a very slick way to do it. If you download the hydronics that we have as a handout, there's a lot of detailed discussion on this. You know, Max and I are trying to summarize a lot of data into an hour, but if you go through that catalog, you'll find uh, a lot of really cool stuff on that. So um, on that note, we kind of want to just sort of wrap up with uh, what we consider to be, you know, our uh, our 10 tips to a, uh, a good hydronic heat pump design. Uh, so number one for me would probably be to select the correct equipment for the project. You know, if, if you have a job where you know you're just doing radiant floor, you've got nice oversized air handlers, and you know you can run it at 110 or 120, great. Pick a traditional air to water, pick a standard water to water. If it's a high temp application, you can find high temp equipment. You know, there are units on the market that will produce 140 degree water. But again, if you don't need the 140, don't run it at 140. You're going to negatively impact the efficiency of the equipment. To Max's point, make sure you're using buffer tanks properly. Like, don't don't just use some rule of thumb where I've got a 40 gallon that'll work. You know, a 40 is better than nothing. But last time I checked, you know, we got a lot of people here interested in doing it right. Let's do it right. The buffer tank helps you properly decouple. It gives you that start to your primary secondary, which is very key. Obviously, size your piping properly. Max talked about this. I talked about this. Make sure that you're eliminating pipe competition. We don't want to see closely spaced T's on heat pumps. 
you know, design it so that you've got that nice, short, fat header. That's the key things to keep in mind. That header has to be short, can't be 50 feet long or you'll have a pressure drop across it. But short, fat, keep the velocities very low. And then obviously ensure that you have methods of controlling and delivering the proper water temperature. If you don't need a mixing valve, don't put in a mixing valve. If you do have air handlers and radiant floor and you just put in a unit that can produce 150 degree water, well, you're gonna have to do some mixing on that. There's, there's no way around that. Or pipe it differently so those waters don't see each other, water temperatures don't see each other. Max and I both talked about future proofing. It's pretty easy. Tighten up the piping, pick slightly better materials. You can make that boiler job you're doing now be future proof for the heat pump that might be there in 10 or 15 years. To Max's point again, make sure you're utilizing proper air separation. You know, you're paying for BTUs, whether it's being a heat pump with electricity or a boiler, make sure those BTUs are going where they're supposed to be. You know, make sure that it's not being insulated by air in the system. Limit those failures. Don't have pumps that look like the one that Max was showing you. It's important to get it out there. Dirt separation, same deal. We just talked about it. A very, very small amount of scale. You might never even hear back from that customer will have a huge impact on the performance of the unit. The other thing I'll point out to you is just because you didn't hear back from that builder, that architect or that homeowner, doesn't mean that Max didn't hear from them or I didn't hear from them. They might have gave up on you and just called your competitor, right? This, this idea of, well, I, I did it for 20 years and I never had a problem. No, you did it for 20 years and maybe somebody else was fixing your problems, right? And that's that's happened to all of us. It's happened to me, I'm sure it's happened to Max. You know, we, we've had to learn some things the hard way. Make sure you're doing this properly. Uh, here's a big one. You know, we have a lot of contractors on this call, but for any builders or designers, pick the right contractor. You know, it's just so irritating to me. And Max, I'm sure you're the same. When I see this high-end home gets done, I get called out to have a look at it because it's not working. I had that call today. You know, our customer was a couple of thousand dollars more on a 200,000 BTU heat pump system. So multiple heat pumps. And it's it's a total disaster. It's like, where do you start with what's wrong here? So Pick the right contractor and find out if they have heat pump experience. You know, if they say that they're doing Taco air to water units, talk to Taco. If they say they do water furnace units, call me. You know, it's, you know, find out what that background is. Make sure you pick a big, a good contractor that knows what they're doing. And the other one is pick a good supplier. Like Max and I worked together at Ray Howe because Ray, or worked together when he was at Ray Howe, just because, you know, Ray Howe is an awesome product. I'm not interested in nickel and diming to save a few dollars to have a mistake down the road. Same can be said for Colapi, and we're no different. At the end of the day, we want to give good service. We want to provide adequate designs. You may not deal with us. Just find that supplier in your neck of the woods that's going to give you the design, that's going to hold your hand, make it work, and teach you something. You know, just like the builders shouldn't be low dollaring the contractors, you would be amazed that you can pay the same price dealing with a specialty manufacturer like Kalefi or a specialty distributor like Eden and get a much better product when you're done with it. And then obviously just think through your piping. We just sort of want to reiterate the whole, think through the piping before you start. Do you really need mixing valves? Do you need primary, secondary? Yes, every time, let's throw that out there. You know, pay attention to your emitters, what kind of emitters you're using. Let's try to make sure you have a successful install. Max, what can you add to our 10 points? <laughs> I think that, like you said, there's nothing more expensive than doing it twice. So, you know, protect your components, low temperature distribution, low temperature heat emitters, surface area is your friend on the heat emitter side. And uh, yeah, I just think this is a fun conversation. I don't think that this, you know, electrification thing is going away. It's uh, it's big in California here, but it's, you know, it's moving its way across. And I, I love boilers and I think there's still a great place for them. If you don't need 180 degrees, it just opens up the conversation a little bit more. And I think that these were some some good tips to at least you know look at your next project and see, okay, could I do something differently here? Why? How? You know, what's the use case? And yeah, that's uh, that's kind of what I've got. But yeah, thanks again for uh, having me as a guest. And um, yeah, any questions that you want to go through? Yeah, well, now we're getting to the best part. I've just pulled the question tab up. So Max and I are gonna take a stab at, at answering all of your questions that we can. Uh, obviously, uh, if you leave this webinar and have questions, uh, you're all gonna get an email from me. Uh, you know, I'm on LinkedIn, you can connect with me. Uh, don't hesitate, you know, reach out to me. You can reach out to Max on LinkedIn as well. Uh, you know, and if you have a specific question for Max, shoot me an email, I'll be happy to forward it to him. 
you know, we, we enjoy doing this. That's why we're here at uh, seven o'clock doing, uh, doing a webinar because it's a lot of fun for us. So with that said, I'm going to quickly uh, dive into some of these questions. Uh, let's see what we got here. Oh, so Chris Cameron, uh, he works with IBC, really good guy. He points out that boiler heat exchangers are the hottest part of your system, which loves magnet height. A hundred percent true. You know, you're not going to have issues with that magnet height getting adhered into the buffer tank. Like it's it's not going to be there. It's going to be in the ECM pump because it's magnetic. But the number one place that that magnet height and frankly any debris loves to adhere itself is to the hottest spot. It just gets caked on there, and then it's going to be a problem for you for the rest of the life of that equipment. So it's like activating the glue right there, and that's where it's going to stop. A hundred percent. So I mean, if you have a maintenance program and if you flush it regularly, there are products out there that will get you out of that pickle. But the reality is, putting in good water is not difficult now. It's very inexpensive to do. Uh, PuroPile is a great product. Costs ninety bucks to buy. It's got a color changing resin. You know your water's good. Like. You got a garden hose, you're away. Like it's a great, great way to do it. Um, so yeah, no, that's a great comment. Um, uh, Irving made a great comment saying multiple heat pumps with no reverse return. That's right. So we size all of that piping so that it's basically acting as a short fat header. So there's not going to be any dynamics. There's no pressure drop happening between those pumps. Uh, I do the same thing with my boilers. Um, I think I've done reverse return once or twice. Max, you, how many times are you doing? So maybe if you had to spread out your, you know, heat pumps across a long crawl space or something like that, it could be different, but you know, it's, it's best to just pipe into that short fat header. And then, uh, the reverse return isn't, isn't as big a deal there. As long as, like you said, you've got the, the space in the pipe that they can be all on or, you know, one on or whatever. Yeah, the one advantage to reverse return is it can be less expensive. So uh, in the job that I was working on today, it's 200,000 BTUs. Uh, and because I was doing the short fat header instead of reverse return, I was up into two and a half inch pipe, which most people go 200,000, two and a half inch, that's crazy. So to Irving's point, if I'd have done it reverse return uh, with zone valves and flow setters, and I might, you know, I'm not, I never say never, uh, it would potentially be less money to do it. But Again, it's a high-end home. They're not pressuring me to try to save a little money on the piping. They just want to make sure that it's going to uh, work properly. And with primary secondary, it doesn't affect that piece of it. So you could do short fat headers or reverse return as long as you have the primary secondary or the buffer tank. You're not changing anything there. So both are acceptable for the separation part. Yeah, for sure. Um, Sean makes a really good comment about active volume. So one of the things, and so I personally don't count the floor. We are doing a house right now. It's actually a cottage in the Muskokas. Uh, it's 28,000 square feet. So we will count those floors because they're huge. Uh, one of the things you got to be very conscious of though is if they zone it, and John makes, uh, Sean, pardon me, makes this point, is if they zone that, you can't count on that floor anymore because it's no longer an active zone. Uh, so he's just saying if an engineer or contractor counts water volume, they can't count on zones that are closed. Sean, 100% agree with you. I'm glad you brought that up uh, just so we could throw that out there. Uh, I assume people would know that, but they, there's an old saying, you know what happens when you assume. <laughs> and even in that, you know, even in a, a monster house, it's still not that many gallons. It's not like it's going to be a 120 gallon buffer tank of capacity especially if it's in pex or something like that it's it's surprising how little volume is in that much surface area yeah and half inch pex it's like 0 0.01 gallons per 100 feet so it, it's you gotta have a lot of half inch pex but you know in big houses you could have three quarter inch piping in there you could have a lot happening so it is a possibility but the key thing is that you know like sean is doing with this great question is make sure somebody's doing the math uh, and if you need help doing the math, reach out, you know, or we're, we're available. We're happy to help you. Um, you know, it's, it's a good comment. So thank you, Sean, for sharing that. Uh, I'm sorry if I murder your name. Pratik is just saying for on off heat pumps, what are is an ideal on off cycles in a day? And I'm going to answer with one cycle would be my ideal. I'd like to see that unit just sort of turn on and, and run as low and slow as possible. Uh, in reality, you're, you're going to probably have two or three cycles throughout the day. Uh, but it's certainly not unusual to see that unit to run for 12 hours in a day, like with an un uninterrupted run time. Um, as much as we've been talking about units that are fixed speed, 
uh, most units at this point are two speed units. So uh, first stage is typically 70% capacity. Second stage is obviously your 100% capacity. You will also get into multi-stage equipment. So there are a lot of manufacturers, including water furnace that we're the distributor for that have variable speed equipment where you do get that full modulation. So at that point, I am expecting with a modulating unit, it could literally run the entire day. It's not running at full fire. It might be at 10% capacity, but really whether it's a heat pump or a boiler, if you can size that so it's running low and slow, uh, that is definitely the ideal. Uh, Max, I'll throw this one at you. So this one, Adam's saying, is there a recommended minimum runtime uh, for modulating or on-off equipment? I answered on-off. Why don't you take a stab at modulating? Although I might have answered. So in the the boiler world, you know, 15 to 20 minutes seems like a you know somewhat of a reasonable answer. The longer, the better. I mean, every time that that boiler turns off, you have to post purge where you have to take, I forget what it is, you know, three and a half times the volume of the heat exchanger. You have to send that up through the roof. So you're cooling down the heat exchanger, start colder, bring it back up to temperature before you're even really distributing the heat. So the, the less times you do that in an hour, the better. Um, and as far as the amount of times on the odometer that you're going to do an ignition cycle, you're just going to be replacing components faster if you're on and off every five minutes. So, I mean, the equipment is, is built to do it a certain amount of times, <laughs> and then um, you're going to have, you know, igniters and, and things like that that are just kind of worn out. So uh, same thing as a heat pump. If you could have that on all day because you had a buffer tank and the right turndown, great. I think that that's you're not wasting any energy with a post purge that sends it all you know nice warm energy that you already paid for up and out the roof we don't want that so yeah for sure no i i completely agree with you i think most people would max it, it makes a lot of sense um so sean has got a good question uh and this one actually irks me sometimes so he's saying when you want to do primary secondary with t's what's the maximum distance between the t's that will work uh, he's saying four pipe diameters. I've seen six pipe diameters. Not sure they work. So, Sean, uh, I saw a drawing this week where my customer was told he piped it wrong, uh, and they were making him do a couple of things uh, that irritated me. One of the most irritating was moving the T so they had at least 12 pipe diameters between them. So I said, do what this guy is asking you to do, and just be prepared to send him a bill when you undo what this guy is asking you to do. So the answer is it should be less than four pipe diameters. I mean, the reality is you should just get those T's as close together as possible. Yeah, as close um, as possible. Again, I'm not a big fan of closely spaced T's. And if you want to talk, Sean, after this, you shoot me an email, we can jump on a call, whatever. We, I don't think you need to be using closely spaced T's anymore. Um, it adds more parts that you don't need, including an entirely other pump. And you can get away from that uh, in a big way, unless you're doing you know, your heat pump two closely spaced T's, then your secondary, which is uh, pretty commonplace. The other thing too with that, if you have a ball valve in between those closely spaced T's, they are no longer closely spaced because there's an equivalent you know, foot penalty to that ball valve, even if it's what you know, people call a full port. Uh, there is some turbulence there. You are gonna add a little bit of a penalty there. So even if you're really close together with the ball valve, it's it's not really closely spaced in the same way. Maybe much easier to purge, which is why people do it, uh, but it's not the same concept. Yeah, it, it has to have no pressure drop. We want to keep the pressure drop to a minimum. So that's a great comment by Max. You can't have anything in the middle. So where you see those purging tees where they have the, the two tees and the valve in the middle, it's it's for purging, right? It's so you can flush it. Webstone makes them, we stock them, we love them. It makes our life easy. The other thing that you can't do, and I, I maybe should have put the slide in, but Max and I will do a future presentation on like 10 things to never do, or we'll share photos of stuff we've seen, is you cannot, when you're doing closely spaced T's, let's say you have two of them, it's not supply, supply, return, return. So it's hard for me to illustrate without putting up a mechanical drawing. You'll actually end up with reverse flow going through those T's. Yeah. You'll have mixed water, it's a big no-no. Uh, Max, I had only seen it once, and it was within the last six months. I saw it in the wild. I was super excited to see it. The guy sent me a bunch of photos. I now have it in my slide decks. The fix was very easy. Cut it out, yeah. put them in properly. Everything's working great now. Uh, Josh Chase makes a great point. He loves the Puro Pals. Uh, he just used one at his place. He did an awesome installation. So we're looking forward to get photos of that. He also says it's very important to get a heat loss. Yes, uh, yeah. very important to get a heat loss. 
even if it's a retrofit, just because there's a 100,000 BTU boiler there doesn't mean it needs 100,000 BTUs. Uh, you'll see that much worse. You'll see 200,000 BTU boilers in a home. You're like, this place is 2,000 square feet. What's, what's going on here? The reality is there was a point where you could only get certain sizes of equipment, and uh, that's why you saw it. Um, Irving has said, uh, can you share any air to water heat pump specs? Absolutely. Uh, so if you shoot me an email, uh, after this, I can share a couple with some units that we're in particular looking at, um, both these units, one, in fact, has variable speed, both can do higher water temperatures up to 140. I was hoping to have them for this presentation, but again, because there's so many new, exciting products coming and we didn't want to make this a three hour presentation, we kind of pared it down a bit. I'm sure that uh, Max and I will dive into this topic again soon. Uh, we'll just uh, divvy it up with some more content. Um, John has a good question. How about a combi system with domestic hot water as the buffer tank uh, and only an air handler off that? Max, what do you think of that one? That one I'd probably need to think about a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what I would say, John, is I'm going to go back a slide. I would do this. I would do the Thermomax. So you're doing exactly what you're thinking of doing. Uh, as long as I'm understanding the question properly, it could be I'm not, in which case, shoot me an email. Be happy to properly answer the question. Uh, but this is nice. It does your domestic hot water, allows you to isolate for an air handler. Um, but yeah, if, if we haven't properly addressed that, uh, let us know. Uh, Irving is asking. Uh, about two particular brands. So yes, actually I've looked at both of those Irving. Uh, I don't want to name them just, just because I'm gonna say something bad about one of them. Uh, so both are good products. One, I saw the price tag and went, no, thank you. Uh, it was it was crazy, crazy expensive. Again, if you want to call me when we're not doing this live with over a hundred people, I'd be uh, happy to have a one-on-one -on -one with you. Uh, here's one for you. Uh, Max, Justin would like to know what type of copper we should be using on our hydronic systems. Okay, I, I think that the underlying question is the velocity there, that you can use whatever wall thickness of copper you want. If you're set up to be you know, pumping at 10 feet per second, that's the issue. <laughs> I think that like if you're having pinhole issues and you're thinking, oh, I might need to go to a thicker wall of copper, you're probably over pumped. I think that the, the wall thickness of copper is probably, you know, if you've had issues is the symptom um, and if you're keeping that velocity, I think the copper development handbook says less than five feet per second. And then, you know, especially if you're talking about domestic research and things like that, that's kind of what you need to pay attention to. I think I'm not the, you know, the ultimate copper expert as far as wall thickness goes, but the issues I think are usually an over pump under size more than they are. I picked the wrong wall thickness. Yeah, Justin, we joked about it, uh, you know, earlier when I, I showed some manifolds where we were showing pumps on some and valves on other, you know, it, it's just we do these drawings sort of as we're getting ready for training. So sometimes they have valves, sometimes they have pumps. You know, it, it's not a joke when I say I've been to jobs like uh, I went to a series of jobs with tiny little three station manifolds. So realistic, about a gallon and a half a minute of flow and they've got UP 2699Fs on them. So you know, at that point, it really doesn't matter what type of copper you're using, but your copper selection is going to be dictated by your design. Uh, you know, there certainly are a lot of guys that are using type L copper on it, but if you're designing your systems properly, design them for the right flow velocities, uh, it's, you know, it's easily managed. Let's put it that way. Uh, I know that our team in particular and Kalefi's team as well, anytime we get involved in designs, flow velocity is number one. You know, yeah, we're looking at what the flow is, some cases you'll give us a job and we're going to look at that going, how can we control this flow? Do we need to make it 10 gallons a minute? We'll adjust delta T's to bring that number back. But really, we're trying to control flow velocities, pressure drops, and making sure we're picking the right equipment. You know, you don't need a jet engine, uh, you know, when it comes to a half inch piece of PAX or a half inch piece of copper. So good question. Thanks, Justin. Uh, Nick is asking, what are your thoughts on relying on pipe water volume in cascaded inverter driven systems? Uh, minimum modulation is quite small with typically large common headers. 100%, Nick, completely agree with you. Uh, I would just say do the math. You know, it's uh, it's not hard math. Uh, the math is in the handout, and obviously, if you have a particular design you'd like us to look at and comment on, we we can do that for you. We can have a look at it. But it's not unusual in systems with large water volume in the piping that you would count on that piping, uh, as long as it's not going to get valved off in in any way.
Well, that was a lot of really good questions. Uh, uh, so uh, Josh is saying, what would you prefer to see instead of closely paced space T's? Uh, I think he jumped in towards the end, which is fine because we're gonna go back four or five slides. So much easier to show. Actually, this is a good illustration. This is what we'd like to see. We'd like to see a short, fat header. In this case, they had a lot of 12 station manifolds. So again, keeping the flow velocity very, very low, so there's no pressure drop between these pumps. Uh, nice, simple, short, fat header. Uh, and in fact, Max has a nice illustration of it here too. So this, this piping. Way, zone one doesn't make zone two colder, make zone three colder, like you showed before, where the you know closely spaced T's are in series is the is the issue. Yeah, so uh, exactly what he said. So this piping here uh, is allowing for the fact that basically it's now part of this hydraulic separator. There's no pressure drop whatsoever. Uh, if this piping here, and hopefully everyone can see my mouse okay, was the same size as the piping going into the pumps, you'd have a bully effect. So these two little guys would not have adequate flow if these three big guys were running. They're basically, you know, it's, it's you know, like the big 300 pound guy that decides he wants to push Max around. Like he's got a lot of inertia. He can definitely uh, push Max and I around. It's it's not a good situation. So you definitely want to uh, want to pay attention to that. Um, good question. Uh, Irving says L pipe should use every time uh, water is circulated. I'm not going to knock it. Um, and I think at that point we've done a pretty good job, Max, at answering all the questions. Cool. Uh, anything you want to add? And I think at that point, unless I find something, I'm going to call it uh, call it a night. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks again for having us on. And if you have any uh, questions, let us know at uh, the Kalefi Hydronics on our website. The U.S. website are great. Uh, nice kind of uh, like a, a third party looking at hydronics more than just a sales pitch for our products. Uh, that's a great place to start. And then, uh, yeah, let me know if uh, anybody else has a specific question that I can follow up with afterwards. Yeah. So obviously we appreciate everybody coming and hanging out with us. Max, appreciate you coming. Um, the next training that we'll be doing is uh, 10 tips to a successful system. So we're going to be doing a review of CSA B214 and uh, how people can be designing systems that don't just meet code but exceed it. Uh, it's not expensive. It's not difficult. It's just a matter of understanding what needs to be done. Um, obviously, if you have any questions after this training, feel free to reach out. Um, we certainly appreciate you making the time, and it's been a lot of fun. So, Max, I appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks, everybody. All right, guys. Take it easy. Bye.